Howdy Riffers, this is David Sanchez, and this is episode 46 of the Riffs or Die podcast for Wednesday, August 25, 2021. I hope this message finds you well. As always, if you want to support the podcast, you can go to riffsordie.com and pick up some merch, or you can go to patreon.com slash riffsordie and subscribe to be a patron. Feel free to shoot me emails, questions, comments, concerns. Send them over to podcast at riffsordie.com. I've got a killer interview lined up for next week, so really looking forward to getting that one done. You will soon know who that one is with. So in this one, we're going to get to the second portion of the interview with Nick Shingelis, bass player extraordinaire. Who's played in Job for a Cowboy, Havoc, Cephalic Carnage, Nuclear Power Trio, etc. In this part of the interview, I'm going to back it up basically five minutes. So you'll hear the last five minutes from episode 45's interview. If you haven't heard the whole first part of the interview, I would definitely recommend going back to episode 45 and listening to that. So you can listen to this one and have full context for everything. But even if you don't want to do that, that's totally fine. Freedom of choice is a beautiful thing. So just to keep things in perspective here, this section of the interview is starting with our discussion about UFOs and alien technology. Let's go! But the tech is real. Those things are real. So if that stuff's real, what the hell are we doing arguing about any of this shit for? Like, why... Why do we not have access to that technology? Is it, are there, you know, the beings inside of them? Are they not, are they willing to communicate with us? Are they not willing to communicate with us? Are they the ones that seeded us and they're just monitoring their ant farm? Like, like I what said, the hell is going on? I, I, that's the biggest question, and nobody <clears throat> gives a shit either. That's the craziest part to me. I think nobody the gives people, a shit about any of that. I think the people that are in control want to maintain that control, and <laughs> you lose a lot of control if everybody has uh, spaceships. And free energy, you know, and, and and understands like that this universe that we're living in is even more spectacular than we can already witness. Yeah, and this is just one universe. Yeah, you know, the uh, UFO thing, I can't help but think of Admiral Byrd, Operation High Jump, mm, yeah, going, you going to seems- Antarctica. Interesting stuff. He claims that there, he saw fresh water and jungles down there, and uh, their whole fleet, military fleet, about half of it was lost. They said it was from flying objects that are similar to what you're describing, and a lot of people would call flying saucers. And uh, uh, apparently, during Operation High Jump, the mission was to search and destroy a Nazi base on Antarctica. And I I don't necessarily believe this. I don't necessarily think it's completely unthinkable. I'm I'm on the fence. I'm just aware of of the theory that there was a Nazi base on Antarctica and they had access to anti-gravity technology. And they were in in cahoots with extraterrestrials and building uh, spaceships, essentially. Man, that's, uh, you know... uh I read into that stuff and it was, you know, some of the stuff that's like, okay, well there was an expedition sent down there. Like that's real. They did send, you know, four destroyers and like 4,000 troops, but it was for an expedition, mm-hmm. like an exploratory expedition is mm-hmm. what the, the official report is or whatever. Um, I don't know why you send 4,000 troops down to Antarctica and four destroyers plus the other ships for an exploratory expedition. I think that doesn't fit in with, you know, I think you'd send a team full of scientists and maybe a few, you know, soldiers or whatever in case you encounter armed penguins or something. But um, <laughs> it's weird, you know, and and, and, and and then even that with that Russian, you know, documentary that you sent that was finally translated and, and, and them going into the whole concept that they had found a bunch of Hitler's um, documents and that he was, you know, obviously it was, it's well known. He was highly interested in the occult yep. um, and highly interested in, in experiments on humans and, and all this crazy, crazy stuff. And that uh, apparently it found blueprints in there for, for some of those devices. Like, but 
I saw the other thing too that was like, oh, well, what are the potential for extraterrestrials to be down with Hitler's cause? You know, like, and that that's that they weren't, and that that was part of the reason why there was the a fall or whatever is because they were like, you can't use this technology for uh, for what you're doing. But the interesting part is this, because all that stuff is so fantastical that it's just like, okay, dude, yeah. Right, right, right. Might as well be fucking Nazi base on the moon. And then we got to, you know, <laughs> that fucking, uh, what was that? What was that movie? Iron Sky. Ugh. Yeah. It, it, Iron it Sky. is really fascinating though, that Antarctica stuff. is off limits. You're not allowed to go there as a civilian and you can't well, fly safety, over though. Antarctica. That's just for your safety. Oh, right. Yeah. They just don't want you getting lost. Just like wearing a mask on an airplane, but I can take it off to eat some pretzels and drink some water and everybody else can at the same time for my safety. Well, if you, but you have to pull it back up though. Oh yeah. I forgot. I got to pull it back up after eating the pretzels and drinking with everybody else at the same time. Well, but here's the thing. Science. Well, here's the thing. So the interesting thing I was going to say about the, about the, the whole fantasticalness of the, the sort of the absurdity of, you know, you know, Hitler having a base on Antarctica or in Antarctica or under it or whatever. Mm-hmm. And that, and that, you know, that they went down there, there were these flying saucers and stuff. Well, they we do know that he was spending a lot of money and sending a lot of resources down to Antar- uh, Antarctica yep. at a time when it was not in any of the German military's interest to be wasting any money. I Correct. mean, they were, they were on the ropes and getting their asses kicked and then you're going to spend a bunch of money fucking sending subs down to Antarctica? Like, what the fuck are you doing? I mean, also, I don't think anybody would disagree with the fact that the guy was crazy, sociopath uh, nightmare of a person. But Mm -hmm. um, the fact is this, that those reports of the unidentified aerial phenomenon go back 70 years. Yeah. Uh, The Roswell crash was in... 37? 40, is that right? 47. 47? Yeah. And, and the Russian records go back then too. It's 70 years. So, so the timeline fits for when this supposed Operation High Jump shit would have happened. The timeline fits that there were flying saucers for sure on Earth at that time. So then all of a sudden, is it so insane? Is it so absurd to believe? It's no more absurd to believe then right now, there's flying saucers that get reported every single day. Tic-tac things every single day. And they're real now, and it's no longer, you're the crazy guy from Oklahoma uh, drinking your moonshine <laughs> and seeing something. It's real now. It's yeah, real. it's on n- mainstream news and stuff. And it's been, and, and those reports go back 70 years. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's interesting, too, that it's alleged that it was the Germans that had access to this high technology and the very first thing that was ever televised around the whole world was what? Hitler. The Olympics in Germany, Nazi Germany. Yeah. Yeah. Hitler, Hitler was the first thing that aliens would have heard from Earth. It, yep. They would have probably been like, <laughs> Talk Whoa, about this is, putting your... Jesus. These guys are the highest technology. I mean, let's be honest, though. Germans did have a lot of super high technology versus the rest of the world. They invented V2 rockets. They invented oh, yeah. all kinds of things. And they were super I mean, obsessed with with scientific experimentation. Yeah, yeah. They just had a very low regard for the value of human life. Yeah. So did China. So did Russia. So did the U.S. I mean, you, you could argue that all around the world, that that's a theme that's that's common uh, in certain situations throughout history. Right. You know, look at like what happened in uh, World War One. It's just you know. Throw as many oh, yeah. people as you can at the machine guns and whoever mm-hmm. makes it, good fodder. luck. Fodder. Just fodder. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it even goes back way further than that, you know? Yeah. I mean, it goes back probably forever. Yeah. The disregard for human life when it comes to maintaining power is, is a fucking story as old as time. Right. Well, it, you know, it's like that Braveheart quote, though, you know, when uh, Robert the Bruce, his dad goes behind his back and sells out William Wallace and that the, the, the Scots don't end up getting their back, the Highlanders or whatever. And then he's like, as a king, you must learn to see the good in any situation, in any outcome. And that you having to make the decision between who lives and dies uh, as your responsibility and your power grows when you're in battle, 
and you're like, okay, I'm going to, I need to send these guys to this, right? Because we have to hold that. If we lose this bridge, this many more lives will die. Sure. But I know that I don't have, I only have enough troops to basically send there and hold it and lose 60, 70% of the troops. So you're deci- you're deciding that these people are going to die, which people would be like, that's fucking horrible. You're just, you're, you're just playing with these people's lives. You're like, but yes, but I'm saving these 10,000 lives by holding that bridge. And what would happen if the other side would be able to take that bridge? So it's a job I would never fucking want. And, and it makes it easier for me to not pass judgment upon people who are in those positions where they do have to decide who lives and who dies because those decisions need to be made every day. And I'm just glad I'm not the guy and fuck that. You know what I mean? I wish this stuff wasn't real. We wish that human beings would all just get along and that imperialism wasn't real and some and, and dominance and and uh religious superiority and I think I just made that word up but superiority um, <laughs> superiority super religious but you know you wish that this stuff was you know that people would just thrive and figure out that cooperation is the real evolutionary apex the the the, the way that evolution now, that's why i like to look at that difference you know that book we, uh, I, I shared with you a while ago and, and is one of my favorite books is um bruce lipton's spontaneous evolution Great where he book. kind of goes into the separation of darwinian evolution versus like a lamarckian jean baptiste lamarck lamarckian evolution mm-hmm. and that lamarckian evolution actually makes more sense yeah way more. Um, is survival of the whole via cooperation well, you know, it, that, as I remember, it wasn't just that. It was not the survival of only the survival of the fittest, but basically the elimination of the least fit. It's only right. the least fit that die off. If you're average or above average, you're probably good. Right. You know, when the lion's chasing after a bunch of gazelles, it doesn't go after the one in the middle of the pack. It gets the weakest one. Because for the weakest, yeah, or the youngest. You know, the easiest, the easiest target. But yeah, but that seeing that, that like the overall the survivor of the whole, that the organism diversifies, you know, the, the overall organism, earth, the planet diversifies its life for survival. And so that, that it doesn't have to be about competition and stomping out your competition or whatever, but that cooperation no. does work. Cooperation and altruism, I think, are like the more higher right. higher frequency, higher consciousness, higher brained, however you want to right. put it. That's yeah. that's easily identifiable as the, you know, more evolved way to be. Right. To cooperate and get along than to be at war like fucking dogs over territory. Right. And I guess that comes back into scarcity though. It's like people will, until things get scarce, until resources get scarce, people will be cool. If, if, if you've got everything you need, if you're fed, if you have water, if you have a shelter, uh, you have all your needs met and then some, the likelihood that you're going to stab somebody for the spot and gas in the, in the gas line at the, at the end of the apartment, you know, is, is pretty low. You know what I mean? Like for the most part, when people are taken care of and fed and have all their needs met, they're a lot more jovial to each other and a lot less likely to, to want to fight each other because they don't have to fight each other sure. for those resources. So do we have enough resources? I guess that's the question. It comes back to your thing earlier. Of, is there some type of manipulation going on with that stuff? Energetically speaking, if, you know, I, I just can't get over that, that there's tech out there that very blatantly and easily can far surpass the E R O E R I of petroleum, even which is the best that we've got. That that there's stuff out there that smokes it. Like we get to power everything on the planet forever, and energy's just abundant. How about like Stan Meyer, who was in Colorado Springs and made that car run on water? He modified a car engine to run on water. Man, I'd have to see that. Oh, dude, it was all over like local news and stuff in late eighties, early nineties, something like that. Anyway, he was being offered a billion dollars cash for the patent to his uh, invention there. He wouldn't give it up. He was like, I'll license it, but I don't want to give this patent away because you guys will just buy it off me and bury it. And I want everyone in the world to have this. Well, mm. he was poisoned. That's interesting. They gave a talk and um, 
you know, after one of his meetings with a bunch of investors and people who are interested in his invention, they all went out to eat after that. He was the only one died from food poisoning. I thought he died from COVID. It probably was COVID, actually, now that you mention it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But but there's that guy. There's a dude I just saw the other day who invented a motorcycle. That's the same thing. It uses electrolysis to separate the hydrogen from the oxygen, and it runs on the hydrogen. You know, mm. uh, you've heard of like an H bomb, a hydrogen bomb. It, it's way more devastating than a nuclear atomic bomb. Right. Um, the hy- hydrogen can be used as a fuel. And this dude that has this motorcycle that I just saw uh, the other day, I'll, f- I'll have to find it and send it to you. He says that he can get 500 kilometers, which is over 300 miles per one liter of water. Wow. I mean, and Stan Meyer, same kind of thing. Um, I think it was like a gallon of water will get you like 600 miles down the road or something. Really? And, and here's the thing, too. It could be any kind of water. It could be rain, could be snow, could be ice, could be tap water, could be ocean water. Doesn't matter. Hmm. Homie got uh, smoked. I mean, uh, you know, I'd have to see that stuff. I don't, you know, I, it's totally possible. I mean, I think some of the like the free energy things where that's just like the free lunch concept is 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 tough to eat. But then at the same time, I don't know what's in those UAP. No, we don't know what's in those UAP. So until we have that answer, how can you shut down the fact that, you know, because the physicists today, engineers, petroleum engineers today, you know, would tell you that's not possible. There's no free lunch. There's no free energy systems. But then if you were to ask those same people to be like, okay, well, what's powering these uh, vehicles that are traveling Mach 20? Probably free I don't energy. Think they would have, I would think they would <laughs> not have an answer for you. You know, they'd be like, I don't know. Well, then you'd be like, okay, well then, so there's technology out there that produces incredible return and incredible amounts of energy that we don't know about yet and that we don't have access to. We know about it, but we don't know what's what's in it and we don't have access to that information, but it's out there. It's out there and it has been for decades. So how do we get it and how do we implement it into our lives and who's powering the shit? The other side of it is I've heard is like, the whole plausible deniability thing that when you hear the, the report come back and them say, this is all we know that they're being truthful because that is that all that they know, because it's an, you know, set up on a, uh, either a need to know basis or it's, it's a, a shadow project or more than likely it's private. It's a private enterprise. Sure. That that could just be in that way. Be like, hey, I don't know. I, I, we literally don't know. Could be one of these aviation companies. Yeah, there's all kinds of technology that is definitely hidden from us. I mean, they don't teach you about Nikola Tesla in school. I was telling you about Stan Meyer, who made the car run on water. There's all kinds yeah. of other people that worked on free energy and anti-gravity machines, and um, they, their names have all been uh, dutifully unwritten <laughs> from yeah. from a lot of mainstream uh, knowledge and compartmentalized, right? Compartmentalized, right. That, Okay, so, and with that kind of technology, I I think they definitely already have it. For instance, I saw an interview with Michio Kaku, Mm. and this was very telling to me. They were talking about cloud seeding and making rain, modifying the weather, right? And Michio Kaku is on this, like, CBS News morning show or something like that, and they're talking to him about cloud seeding and making rain and weather modification. And, you know, he's talking about, we have high powered lasers now. And what we do is when we see a cloud, we can shoot the high powered laser to add it and make rain come out of the cloud because it superheats the cloud and makes the, the water molecules heavy and it rains. Makes sense. Make, makes sense. And you're like, yeah, of course they can do that. And he's like, yes. And it works in the lab. And, uh, <laughs> The the ladies like yeah, but water weather modification's been around for a while or something. You know, some people say that. And Michio Kaku goes, yeah. I mean, the CIA back in Vietnam was cloud seeding and creating monsoons to take out the Viet Cong. And the news lady goes, allegedly. And he goes, oh yes, allegedly, right. What? No way, Michio Dude. Kaku. Yes. I love that guy. I mean, that's crazy. Yeah, I don't trust him so much after seeing that interview, but it is crazy. 
Well, uh, but like the, I said, the, the newscaster up- has to correct edit. him and say like, no, no, that's alleged that we could modify the weather back in the 60s. Mm. And, he, and he catches himself and he goes, oh, yes, yes, allegedly. I've got a thousand gallons of potable water. <laughs> you just like, like it. The harp, the harp machines, and all that shit. We have all these droughts happening in California and Nevada and all these places, like, and we know that they can make fucking rain. So it just goes back to good for people, bad for business. There's so much of that going on, especially today with the you know constant fear campaigns and propaganda. There's so many things that are good for business, not necessarily good for people. Well, there's a thing that's good for business, good for people, and you, the average everyday human, could do it. I mean, you can make it rain. You just got to go to an, a gentleman's club, get a couple thousand wands. A couple throw thousand. It, <laughs> <laughs> throw it into that. Throw it into that little, you know, dollar bill gun. You ever seen those? Yeah, those are great. You ever seen? And then you just it just <laughs> made it rain. He was not lying. Maybe that's what Michio Kaku was talking about. Yes. That's how they were trying to get rid of the Viet Cong in uh, Vietnam. They, they were making it rain dollar bills on him <laughs> in the jungle. Right in between the, the Agent Orange and Napalm it's droppings. It's a, it's a psyop, you know, because like, then they think they're rich. But the value of the dollar is so low that they're really not because inflation. You know, and we don't get heavy because of olive oil. Dude, what the <laughs> hell are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I was tying some, some some different stuff in here. I'm gonna grab a uh, a refreshment really quick. I'll be right back. Okay. All righty, all righty, <laughs> and we're back. Allegedly, allegedly. Oh, what's up, homie? Yeah, I'm gonna have to find that clip, and I'm gonna add it to this podcast. I think. Uh, I think Which I'll one? S- uh, the, slice the, it in the there. Kaku? Michio Kaku. Kaku, yeah. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Yeah, that'd be I, awesome. I think legally you're allowed to do that with copyright. I, I think that you can use it as long as you are using it for commentary. Yes, that's that's fair use. Cool. Commentary or parody? Do you like parodies? Like Weird Al? How about a parodies nuts on your chin? You can't even get to my chin. That's why I grew a beard. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I've always wanted you to shave that chin out of that beard. Just let that chin pop right out. Just have like the opposite of a soul patch. <laughs> just a, just little, a donut <laughs> hole right under my lips. <laughs> Free the chin, dude. Free the chin. <laughs> yeah, well, man. Um, we've already been talking for over an hour here. Uh, do, do you want to uh, tell everybody what you've been listening to, what you've been up to musically? Yeah, for sure, for sure. Musically, uh, we're getting Cephalic Carnage Train um, back on the tracks, um, which has been a long time coming. I think it's 10, shit, that was 2010, 11 years since our last record. So uh, yeah, finally getting that going, which is great. We're going to be playing Psycho Las Vegas, which I'm really stoked about that. A lot of really cool bands, crazy lineup, Jizza, I'm a huge Wu-Tang fan that just a Liquid Swords record is probably my favorite hip-hop record and he's doing that in its entirety I believe and I believe with a live band too which really for me cool. steps up hip-hop live just because when it's just dudes jumping and hype men yeah you know yeah like it's it's a little underwhelming so when they add the live band element in it like really steps the show up in my opinion sure. but then you know Danzig which probably I think we'll probably have um, Lombardo right is he doing it? No, he's playing with Misfits. I'm, I'm not sure right. who's I playing bet. drums for Danzig. I thought he played with Danzig one time, but maybe not. I maybe I had that wrong. Um, but then uh, Down, uh, I think Down's doing Nola, which I'm pretty stoked on. That was another favorite record of mine. Thievery Corporation, kind of a weird left left field thing for a metal fest. But so that'd be cool. First show back after for me, first metal show back. I played with Robert Randolph that you know in July last year. But first metal show back and. Uh, years you know from this whole pandemic thing and, and timing wise but then um recording uh, so we've got about probably an hour worth of material for cephalic um that we'll be getting ready to go record with and then job Sweet. for cowboys got eight songs that are in like a constant state of revision 
constantly being revised and revised and revised. Drums are recorded for that. Um, Naveen did drums for it and it, they came out really sick. Awesome. And then, yeah, so that'll be cool. And then, uh, let's see here. I'm singing for a band called Vamana, which is Zach Joe from Safala Carnage. And then, uh, Igor, you know, Igor, our good buddy, uh, amazing bass player. Do you know how to pronounce his last name? Starts yeah, with a P, ends with a Wix. Yeah. <laughs> P-Wix. Yeah. It's funny that I like I would not know how to pronounce that last name. Pazanda Worker Tika Wix or something. I don't know. Yeah. But uh, Igor is the man. Great, great bass player. Um, and so that record's going to be cool, and I'm just singing. So that's going to be a lot of fun. I've never got oh, yeah. to really do that before. And then um, teching, you know, doing some tech work for, for Nuclear Power Trio. They're just bass player guy that's got a pretty big spot in the world and i I work for that guy kind of help him consulting him on his lines and that kind of stuff and uh doing some video work for them and um and then i may do this this uh ep with danny walker this band called avidas if i can get time in to do that everything is crunching together you know normally when it's like the two band thing happens like for a long time for me it was like two or even three bands and they were kind of weaving weaving themselves kind of perfectly structurally or or, uh, schedule wise. And now it's like all compressing into one thing. Like everybody wants to record during this time. So then everybody's going to want to tour. And uh, if touring happens, I mean, (laughs) I know it's happening right now, but yeah, there's a lot of unknown in the near future. I mean, I just heard from our buddies in France, they were talking about they're going to basically start doing vaccine passports next month. So Europe, Europe might be impossible unless you're vaccinated. But we were talking to Jake. You were saying that Jake was saying that Victoria is just straight out full, full yep. lockdown again. Yep. And that Los Angeles has brought, just brought masks back indoor. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I think the, the potential likelihood of, of a shutdown again is, is very high. And then in that, I mean, it could be in perpetuity. This is the Delta strain. Then there's the Epsilon and there's, it's like Songbird or something, you know. I, I did watch that movie. Yeah. What'd you think? I mean, it's it wasn't the it's highest production value. It's Michael Bay too, so it's but, very uh, you know. No, it was, it was interesting. I, I found the beginning of it more interesting than the latter half because yeah, you know, it got you really hooked into the love story side of it. But in the very beginning, they were setting up the story with how society is run. You know, right. once the, there's that COVID twenty three, and you right, you, you can do this, you can you can't do that. Uh, you gotta fucking wake up every day and take a test that's linked to your smartphone. It'll scan your face. Like it was creepy. The, the 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 first half of the movie was was pretty unsettling. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the potential for us to get there. I mean, you think about if this thing were to actually mutate into something truly deadly um not you know not saying that people didn't die and that it, that it's not a horrible thing people lost people that's that's fucking horrible but if if this thing were to even have been the the mortality rate that the original sars was or even worse i mean imagine if it mutates and it's 10 percent, something like that where it would literally be like significant population reduction what will life be like and i don't know you, you think about those kind of things and it's like man nobody really knows and I think it's it's one of those things where it's really difficult to have any certainty about the future because we just don't know. You don't know. I mean, we don't know if a certain percentage of the population being unvaccinated and then the mutation occurring in that, or it could very easily be that the mutation happens in uh, on the other side of things, and so that 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 becomes where a, a much more deadly strain mutates out of. Um, we just don't know. The cat's been let out of the bag. There's nothing we could do about it. Can't go back in time or whatever the hell. But I sure as hell think that it's a dumb idea to do gain of function research. I don't think there's any gain. Loss of you know, function I don't think research. Yeah, it's like you guys are fucking playing. It's Prometheus, man. You're- Let's try to figure out how to make this disease more deadly. <laughs> that sounds like a good idea. Let's. Here's a billion dollars. It's just a bad. I just think it was a really bad idea. I don't know how that got. Uh, past you know the yeah, it's interesting to think about and this is you know stuff that could get the we may have to edit out you know because it could get the uh you're gonna be talking about vaselines 
No, um, oh, okay. but the but the um, the impetus for that research. Mm-hmm. You know who who wanted that research, and there was a guy. The guy I went down to Costa Rica with Daniel Pinchbeck. He wrote a book called uh, "2012: Return of Quetzalcoatl," which is one of my favorite books as well. I still love that book to this day, and it's cool because the book, when you read it, it's not like he wasn't interpreting the Mayan calendar to say that that it was the end of the world, that that meant that the world was ending. It, it was related highly to apocalypse, but the etymological root of the word apocalypse was to reveal. So that would be a revelation. Yep. That was really more the, the resetting of the age, entering a new age, not everything's going to happen like a Y2K, everything's going to be screwed, you know? But so anyways, um, it's a really well-written book and um, – I really took to his authoring style. He's one of my favorite authors. And his, his use of alliteration, his phrasing is just awesome. I, I hear it as lyrics. When I read his stuff, I'm like, these are killer lyrics. But anyways, I've kind of followed his stuff. And he, he wrote a book kind of going over the whole like Q thing and the, just the sort of radicalization of all ideas right now in this, this hardcore division. And it was interesting because going into it, you're thinking it's going to be all one, one perspective. But it was really interesting because he goes into it and he just really followed the research, followed the money and stuff, and he goes back into, and he, he's like, <laughs> these Chinese, high-level Chinese military officials stated throughout the last four, five, six years, very openly, that their focus was on biological warfare. And that that's where they felt the greatest return for research, as far as your military budget would be that the results would be the strongest for having something that would allow you to either maintain your position as or become the number one superpower. Sure. Yeah. And that kind of research has been happening since the Cold War, for sure. Even exactly. before that, World War II, or World War I even, mustard gas and shit. Yeah. Bioweapons. But, you know, and, th- and that's got nothing to do with xenophobia. I mean, this is just human nations. The dominance imperative, that imperialism, that setting yourself up for the future, that that it's 100%. Every nation wants to be that, you know, as much as I think everybody would like to believe that everybody wants to get along and and, uh, maintain a balance. If America, you know, could get control over everything and maintain it forever, would they not do that? Any nation. Well, no one wants to be the weak nation. Right. That's for sure. Right. You don't want to be the one that's like, hey, you don't want to be the one that can have sanctions imposed on you that would lower your quality of life for your citizens. Right. So it's just interesting to see that they kind of out and out stated that that this is where they were going to put their chips. And then. The more damning thing to me, (laughs) speaking of and then, was when Fauci himself was talking when Donald Trump was going to become president. He's like, the next administration is going to see a surprise outbreak, I think is the terminology he used. Right. Well, oh. they say, they're, saying that, they're saying that now. Cuomo was saying it. That they're, he's like, not, not if, when the next pandemic happens. Not that they're like, and that, you know, anybody could look at, I think if you look at just the nature of the, the size of the population, that yeah, stuff is going to, viruses and bacteria are trying to stay alive too. Sure. But to call it that it's going to be the next administration was creepy. And then they held that event 201 shit in October yeah. of 2019, just a, a handful of months before everything got locked down. Creepy. Real creepy. It's and, it's, you know, it's, who's behind that is like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the World Economic Forum, and shit oh, like yeah. that. Uh, We're definitely going to have to edit this out if you want this. Behind event 201. (laughs) And uh, the World Economic Forum just held something called Cyber Polygon. And they ran exercises, simulations, just like event 201 was a simulation for a new pandemic. Well, this Cyber Polygon, they ran simulations for a worldwide cyber attack. Mm. That would shut down infrastructure for shipping, uh, power grids, internet, all kinds of shit like that. So they just held that like last week. So we'll we'll see if maybe in five months (laughs) I'll have to see you in person to talk. 
Well, that's the funny thing about that pinchback book. He goes into that too. And where they acknowledged, there, there was another video you sent me too that I was watching where they're like, the pandemic is nothing compared to the power of the potential, uh, you know, ransomware attacks and shutting right. down grid. You know, what, was it the grids. German guy? I think so. Yeah. It was Klaus Schwab. That's the, uh, the chairman or whatever of the World Economic Forum. He's like a straight up Bond villain. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, it may not have been that video. It was, it was another one where they were kind of talking about this stuff and that, and that, uh, but that that's where they're the next real, real big. Like the, the, he would like it would make what happened during 2020 and and, and the first half of 2021 look like look like a joke. Yeah, look like people, a people would be is. wishing that it was COVID all over again. Right, right for the for the ransomware things. And yeah, and they, and they were talking about a, a cyber pandemic a big cyber attack worldwide. And I don't know. I mean, they're already talking about it. The same entities that organized the simulation for a brand new coronavirus that spreads from animals to humans that puts the whole world in lockdown and they need to develop new vaccines and it kills a bunch of people. Same people that organized that are the same ones that were talking about what you're saying. Maybe they're onto something though. Yeah, maybe they just uh, they can just tell the future just totally coincidentally, though. They have nothing to do with it, I'm sure. But maybe they're right, and, and we need this stuff to happen. For the Great Reset? You know, right. Klaus Schwab, the dude that is at the World Economic Forum with the really thick German accent, he's the one that wrote that book, COVID-19, The Great Reset. And he's the one that coined that phrase, I'm sure you've heard, that you will own nothing and you will be happy. Right. Unless you're not. Yeah, but they don't care <laughs> if you're not. Just You're going to own nothing and you're going to love it. Right. This is the world that they're just openly stating that they want to make happen, which, which to me is very interesting that they're they're so brazen with it. They don't give a fuck. They're not trying to hide anything. Yeah. I mean, it's... it's uh... It's hella dystopian. It's it's very bleak feeling. Even that this was the first time I think that there was no there's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to escape to. No, nah, that's why Alex Jones named his shit right Prison Planet. That's crazy, you know, because you like you're like there was always a place you could be like, well, fine, I'll just move down to wherever the hell and just live off the land and whatever. It's like. There's nowhere to go. This is it. That's it. That's right. You know. That's why we got to protect the place that we're at. You know. Unless we can get those ships, those UFOs. Yeah, and get the hell out of here. Yeah, but even then, where do you where are you gonna go? Kansas City. Well, we get to explore forever. We'll we'll find something cool. I'm sure there's another cool. There's got to be a billion Earth-like planets out there. Maybe even cooler. Maybe a little less gravity, just a little bit. So you can freaking jump and do like a 1080 and you land down. I mean, what are the what would be the drawbacks to having a little little less gravity? Your bones would get weak and be easier to break. I don't know. Yeah, but then we'll you know, we want one that's like that sweet spot, just a little bit less. Cuz gravity a little bit less gravity. I just feel like gravity's here to just pull us down, you know? Like, I just want a little, little, little bit less yeah, I find that it's really grounding. Do you think <laughs> Do you think we'd be taller? Yeah, I think so. If, if there was less gravity. Like, that's like, if you think about the shapes and the physicality of, of the different, you know, beings that are reported to exist or whatever, that there's like the tall whites or the tall gray, you know, whatever. Is that like based off of their the gravity of their planet. They have slightly less gravity so that they're able to be a little taller. They're not compressed so much. They don't have chiropractors. No chiropractors in the gray community. <laughs> like, is that a good thing? I mean, are there alien chiropractors? The potential's got to be. Alien huge. chiropractor is a pretty good like song name or band name. A good band name. <laughs> alien chiropractor. Alien acupuncture. That's good. Yeah, I mean, I like I, it. you know, I guess that is the thing. Is like, there's the possibility, there's hope on other planets if this one's done. With other planets, yeah, that's it's something that you could endlessly stew over and ponder about. But 
I think that knowing how this world works, having somewhat of a grasp beyond what the TV tells me, really, I get a lot of benefit from Stoic philosophy and Stoicism because Love Stoicism. it's essentially play the hand you're dealt, do the best with the cards that you've been dealt. But you know, if you can't control something, just you got to cut those ties and leave it in the dust. Right. Fix what you can. And if you can't fix it, fuck it. It's pretty simple. And be grateful for the things you have. And all of that shit added up together allows me to still be happy, even though I understand there's a lot of problems. And like you said, it's, it's looking bleak and pretty dystopian around the corner for our future. But that doesn't mean you have to be miserable. It's true. I mean, there's also that adjustment phase that happens. I think I was reading this book called, uh, shit. That's Can a I weird title. It, it does. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's shit. It's a little TSK. It's <laughs> <laughs> shit. Um, but no, it, uh, it doesn't matter what the name of the book is. The concept is essentially that like, um, we reach, we adapt and we adapt pretty quick. So what we would think is a horrible life or something that we could never be able to tolerate uh, or, or, or put up with it. We're like, if this happened to me, just kill me because I, I couldn't live that way. Uh, that we actually adapt pretty fast to that stuff. And it happens in, on both good spectrum and bad spectrum. So lottery winners, for example, um, that are thinking that everything's going to change and that they're going to be so much happier after they have X amount of money in the bank. And they found that Essentially, after you adjust to it, that we adjust pretty fast, and after you adjust, that's your new medium point, and then you start having the same issue same of general malaise. Yeah, exactly of not being of not being grateful, and so that that stoicism is really the answer to that stuff um, is Gratitude. to be grateful instead of like you know think about that for any any particular situation that you're in. You know, um, if you focus on the positives of that situation and you continually focus on those positives and remind yourself, you know, anytime you slip away and start focusing on the, on the, the things that aren't good about it to remind yourself to keep coming back to it, that, that that's the recipe for essential happiness in the country that we're in. Like, yeah, it's, it's got its faults. But if we go back to what we were talking about a while back, you know, which is like a majority of us in this country have, access to a store close by that has safe food for us to eat, that we can get water out of a tap that's safe for the most part, if you're not in Flint, you know, that the benefits are are vast. There's so much to be grateful for today. Yeah. You always talk about this. We've got supercomputers in our pockets, you know? I mean, we've got the answer to 99 out of 100 questions in our pockets at all times and that it's relatively cheap. I mean, our gas here, has been so cheap. $3 gas is cheap gasoline when you compare it to the rest of the world. Yeah, Europe, UK, it's way more expensive. Unless you're in, you know, one of the uh Saudi Arabia or, you know, something like that, you can get a lot cheaper gas, but comparatively, um we have extremely cheap gas here at $3 a gallon. All those little there's so many positive things to focus on and we could do that. You're right. Like that's the way through this is that, you know, if we just focus on the shit that sucks, life is going to feel like suffering to you. But if you focus on all of the amazing things, there's a book I read called The Rational Optimist. It's really cool. If you haven't checked that one out, I think you'll love it. It's essentially like the guy goes through and he compares like as bad as things feel in our time frame right now. If you compare this to any other time in human history. We're crushing it. We're all kings. Yeah. Say it all the time. Yeah, we better than most kings, czars, emperors, dictators throughout all of history. Just the average American. Yeah. You'd be like, oh, I want a, a Florida orange. I want some uh, Australian or some Tasmanian rainbow trout. I can go do that. Can a, can a king in, in Rome a few thousand years back be like, all right, I would like, uh, I would like some Tasmanian rainbow trout like right no. now. No, and, you know, and like, here's the thing. There, there's one invention solely that's maybe the most responsible for us getting to eat like kings is refrigeration. Mm, love a refrigerator, man. Dude, you the love, refrigeration love a refrigerator. is such a huge 
game changer when it comes to uh, being able to provide food and maintain and store food. Like before refrigeration, you had to eat shit fresh and or think about that. Think about that show it. alone. Just think that show alone. What are they? You know, what do you do? Like if you're if you're like oh cool, say you're the lucky guy. And you, you're next to where the, the salmon are, are, are spawning or whatever. Or like your fishing lines are producing fish, but you know that winter's coming. But let's say that it doesn't freeze there. It gets cold, but it doesn't freeze. Mm-hmm. Um, and you catch 10 fish. Well, how do you make that fish last? You smoke it, turn it into jerky. Uh, you know, other than that, like pretty right screwed. so you get a few you get a few months out of smoking the stuff you get a few months out of it but then let's say that you run out then that 3 months and then you're like oh shit yeah like now you had a freezer <laughs> freezer you're, you're good. good or you just go to a fucking store and you could buy foods from all over the planet <laughs> right and in yeah, an air I mean, conditioned we, room that has light that's not sunlight right you know yeah, and we're, we're so the, spoiled we're super lucky yeah we are and to live when and where we do Especially, you know, like I, I, I am so grateful to live in America. You know, I, I really am. We've been to 40 plus countries. You've probably been to more than I have, much as you guys were getting around back then when it was like play a show every single day for like six months straight. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Know? I, I think I've a been lot to of over 70 now. No shit. Wow. I think, so. yeah, I, think I did like, I think I'm like, maybe I'm like 50 ish because we did, I think we did like 38 on one of our tours. But, um, and then, yeah, maybe I have never really added back in all the South American stuff that we did. Cause we had so many on those South American runs, mm-hmm. you know? Um, but I, and I love all these kind of, I love Germany. I mean, I, I love so many of the countries that we've been to. I love the planet, you know, I really do. And I love all the diversity and, and all the different cultures. And, and I think that it's really what makes life so rich on our planet. But at the end of the day, I love coming home to America. Like I'm yeah. always like, ah, Ice cubes, <laughs> you know, like European um, diamonds, <laughs> European diamonds, as Matt Brunson coined them or whatever. But yeah, but <laughs> so you know, like, and thinking about like living when we do now. The only thing I, I will say is that I, I do think that like that period of time between like 2003 and 2007 ish was like probably my favorite time before, just before the smartphone. I feel like things were really, really good, you know, because that was a good time. Yeah. Flip phones were about as good as we ever needed to get. Yeah. People weren't stuck in their phone all day when there was no smartphones. People would like, you know, do a text or a phone call and then like be off of their phone. They wouldn't be on it all the time. Like, dude, right. The other day I was at a, a ramen restaurant and I saw a, a little girl. She looked like she was maybe eight and it, I think it was her dad and they were sitting at this table across from each other. And I'm pretty sure it was a dad and his daughter and both of them were on their smartphones. They didn't talk to each other almost the whole time that they were in that restaurant. It was really strange seeing this little girl just like on her phone the whole time. Her dad's not talking to her. She's not talking to her dad. They're both just in their own world, busy on their phone doing whatever. Yep, And that's the thing, but, Alicia's family member has a daughter and it's like seven to eight hours a day on TikTok, like every day. It's a lot of time. Seven days a week. Like they'll go out fishing or whatever, you know, go out and and be in the mountains or whatever. And there's just, and perma scroll. They're getting, you know, they get the cell phone horn. We're seeing that happen. Remember the little calcificate, that, that part of the top of the, the, um, the 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 cartilage. Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. That's calcifying. It's calcifying. Yeah, little horns coming out of the bottom of their skull. Yeah, because of the forward neck posture of constantly spending your development of years with your head tilted forward looking down at a screen. And mm-hmm. what that does to the psychology, our psychology and, our, and that kind of stuff. Like I was reading this book uh, or this thing on digital minimalism. We talked about this when you were out here. And I got a flip phone recently because I, I'm sick of that leash of, you know, and if it's there you do it. Like if it's there, you scroll. And if it's there, if you get a text, then the propensity for you to swipe over and check, you know, one of your social media feeds or your email even or whatever for the little red notification endorphin rat button. Bap, 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 bap. Give me that, man. Give me that. Give me that. I want to feel good. I want to feel good. I don't need to feel bored. I don't need to feel bored. And that it's affected 
our ability to work even, to stay focused on the tedium of work, like the tedium of, of completing a song or working on a project or working on an art piece or writing a paper or doing anything, you know, that requires kind of that, uh, that line in between boredom and tedium, you know, of like, man, this is taking, this takes a long time. This is taking a lot of my energy and I'm not getting a reward right away from it because the reward is it's delayed gratification. You know, it's going to be how long before somebody gets to hear that song on a record. And so, our brain goes, well, I can get endorphins right now. I can, I can, I can feel good right now and not be bored right now and just yep. and slip over. And like that is, it's, it's digital crack. It's not, it's, it's not good. It's not good for us. And I don't know. And then you tie in the, the Neuralink stuff and you'd be like, all right, now you're connected literally 24 seven and you and, and you just have, what are we going to just have little overlays, little Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, notification augmented reality overlay contacts or maybe you not even need the contacts sure. just the, the the neuro uh the neural link or neuro what was it we said neural, neural mesh lace yeah neural lace that Is the that neural lace one? can just can just go right into the optic optic nerve yeah that they, they uh did that in futurama there's a whole episode about that they're talking about the iphone but it's eye phone and oh. and they implant it right into your eyeball and all of a sudden you've got that augmented reality screen in front of your face for you to constantly be on your phone. And you know what we talked about earlier too, which is just like, okay, so that, that leading into not dying ever, you know, that like, okay, so there's that side of things where our, our regular life is, that ties into another thing too, really quick that I'll touch on, which is that the, the, the way that, especially children now, but for us too, it's, 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 it's happened is that we no longer live in the moment for the moment. We no longer like do what we're doing, do the activity that we're doing for the experience of it in the moment that we are living it as anticipated memories. We are living it in the constant desire to, Oh, Oh, snap that. Take a picture of this. Take a video of this. We're living it so that we're anticipating the memory of it in the future. or We're anticipating the social response that we'll get from the micro experience, the little digital micro experience, little video, little clip, little picture of that activity. We don't live in that moment anymore. We're living it as an anticipated memory. And so then you get to it and you're like, okay, and then th- that ties in later to what makes life have value for us. If everything has value, then the, the value of everything is zero. You know, it's like if everybody gets a trophy, then the trophy's value is null. It's null and void because it, every, everybody gets one. You didn't sure. have, there's no earning, there's no earning it. So if each experience in our life is just this anticipated memory, right? And we're no longer living it for that moment, then what value does anything in life have? To me, I think the value comes from the scarcity, from this, the singularity, from the, the specificity and the, and the uniqueness of that moment. And that, that's where the value of our individual lives comes from, is from their finiteness, you know, that we don't live forever, that you do have a limited time to experience this. And then what happens to it then if that is permanent and you never, ever die? What meaning will anything have? Yeah, and there's also the whole thing of, you know, your life is subjective and you get to see things through your eyes and nobody else does. It is interesting when people feel the need to document everything that they're looking at that's cool or beautiful. Like, you can't just enjoy it with your own eyeballs and really soak in the magic of whatever it is you're looking at. You got to be looking at it through a, a cell phone screen to record it or take a picture. And and that's sometimes I'm sure everybody for the most part does that. Sometimes I'm guilty of it. Sometimes I'll take a picture of something after I've soaked it in a little bit with my own two eyeballs. But right. I, I see a lot of people, especially young people younger than us that seems like they don't soak in. And, and of course this is a broad statement. This is not everybody. Of course, obviously, but I, I find that a lot of young people seem to just live through looking through their phone screen instead of just absorbing 
the uh, things around them, you know? It's like they don't just take a deep breath and, like, stare at the ocean. They, they got to, like, get a video of it and then do a peace sign with the duck lips into their phone and <laughs> post it on <laughs> Instagram. And then stay on Instagram for the next hour instead of just sitting quietly next to the ocean and staring at that and letting, you know, when you're staring at the ocean, it's like active meditation and it's almost hypnotizing. You like zone out and your brain goes into a, like a, almost like a sleep pattern. It, right. It's, it's really, it does something really interesting when you're staring at the ocean and hearing the noise and smelling the smells and, I, I see so many young people not appreciating that, especially out here. I see people at the at the beach fairly often, right? And it is interesting to me. Just maybe it's because they live here and they've lived here their whole life, so they just take it for granted, and it's not a big deal or whatever. Um, right. Me being from Colorado, seeing the ocean like that, every time I get to see it, it's impressive. It's never yeah. not impressive to see the ocean moving, but. Not even just at the ocean, just all over the place. You see young people doing this. And uh, Louis C.K. even had a bit about it. He's talking about, you know, his daughter's, like, dance recital and how there's parents in the crowd holding up their iPads, filming it, looking through, looking at their kid through the iPad. And he's like, just look at your fucking kid. The resolution with your real eyeballs is even better. Right. Well, that's the thing is, like, Two things. One is I think that the reason that the ocean is salty. It's because the land never waves back. The land never waves back. And maybe the people are salty because they don't wave back either. But it's the same thing with the recital thing is concerts. And that's why like, I, at first when I would go see Tool in the last five years, and they would have like straight up camera Nazis. I mean, they have the, the security trained as i mean it's hardcore they all literally are people watching and specifically your job is to watch if people pull out their phones and if they try to sneak them and you come up you get one tap they check your ticket they make a mark on it they're like next time you're out and they do it you know and at first i was like jesus man what the fucking nazis you know and then i'm watching tool you know and i'm just like I'm watching them with my eyeballs and and taking in that experience the way that we used to before smartphones. And it's so enjoyable to see the entire sea of people at the concert watching and experiencing it for themselves. And that I don't have to see 500 cell phones up in the air blocking my view of this show. And I was like, this is actually fucking awesome you yeah. know because how many people go back and ever even watch the damn videos they took of the fucking band so you get this tiny micro experience with the with the the, the reduced resolution of the camera and yeah they're getting better and and the, and the mics are getting better but it's still a micro experience it's still mm-hmm. a, a a highly compressed version of the full sensory experience that we get as human beings and going and seeing a band and that's over you know unless you have the money like tool does to be able to implement a security policy where they could take that away. Like that shit's long gone. Every concert now, just sea of damn phones. And I get catching, you know, a couple minutes of your favorite song or something, but yeah, we, both of us have seen these fucking nerds at shows that are literally filming the entire show from the crowd, holding up a fucking phone. Blocking other people's view. What are you doing there? Like, bro, that's yeah, that's not cool. You're you're ruining it for other people. You're ruining it for yourself. It was like that other. It was like that. It's like that meme, you know, or the drawing, the cartoon drawing of like, if Titanic, you know, the tie back around to that. If the Titanic happened today, (laughs) yeah, everybody's sinking in the ocean, you know, filming it. D- drowning filming the boat going down <laughs> mm-hmm. like, Dude, well, that's where we're at you know what i mean there's something that it says a lot about who we are and where we are as a society it's gotta be like but that's my but i'm capturing my version like that's me seeing it. i don't know when i watched that video that that was my experience and i want to save that and i, I get that um it is you know, cool I used to, to document quote, things you know if it wasn't for that we wouldn't have documentaries there would be no people like ross halfin there'd be no national geographic there's all kinds of 
ways of documenting things is a beautiful thing to do. And right. I'm not knocking it, and I don't think you are either, that it's just always bad. But it seems like the disconnect today is larger than it has been in, in the past, especially versus when we grew up. When you and I grew up, people had either you know a disposable camera or their own camera, and occasionally yeah. you'd get busted out to take some photos. But it wasn't like hey, I'm going to film everything that we do tonight and then I'm going to put it on the internet for everybody to see tomorrow. Right. That's a new thing. Well, remember back then, you know, Axel would have fucking literally dove off the stage to get that camera out of your damn hand. You know what I mean? Where's the security? Fuck it, I'll do it. (laughs) (laughs) Fucking just... Dives, he just, yeah, like literally Superman. just dives into the crowd to fucking get that goddamn camera. You are not going to be filming Guns N' Roses and putting it on the interwebs. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Interesting times. I think it's going to get more interesting. We we I think, need to yeah. buckle up for <laughs> the idiocracy to keep blooming. Yeah, I just hope that we. I don't know. I it's, my hope, I guess, is that like at least I can stay. I can you know through. Through stoicism and a positive mental attitude, that I can I can continue to enjoy this ride because it is still awesome, even as even as as whack as a lot of this stuff is getting. Yep, it's all about what you focus on, right? My faith in humanity and in our, in our organizational structures and that is is it's tough to keep. It's really becoming more and more difficult to try to keep that up. And to keep keep it high and believe that we have the capability of of changing. But I do like I always come back to uh the day the earth stood still. And uh and I you know, I love all that old sci fi and, and, and that story that the you know, the aliens come down and and they have that sentinel, you know, that's like can basically is impervious to anything we could try to do to it and it can completely just to, demolish us if it wants but it's just kind of chilling and waiting for its waiting for the command to like wipe us out and then there's like these big basically arcs that they're doing you know like these these sort of like organic spherical arcs that go and and are taking all the genetic information and all the life forms and saving it so that the individuality of our genetic expressions as all these different organisms on this planet aren't lost, but that this particular human virus, it needs to be dispatched. And then they have that one guy that goes and tries to make the, let me talk to your leaders, you know, and try to see if we can make sense of this. And he goes to the governments and they're just like, what do you want? What, why did you come into our restricted airspace? What's your intentions here? You know, that really kind of malicious kind of, uh, defensive standpoint. Mm-hmm. And then the, uh, the gal be like, those aren't our leaders. Like, those aren't our real leaders. Like, come meet the real leaders. And she brings them to the brilliant scientists, the real people that are able to, like, that we should be propping up as our role models or, you know, what we could aspire to be. Yeah, and technocracy, that that's what you do. <laughs> but, and they come to them and they kind of like, oh, okay, so you guys aren't all scumbags, that there is this thing. And then she has to convince Clax or whatever, Clatu or whatever his name is or whatever, like the, the, the guy who's sent to try to negotiate to see if it's possible for us to change from being this sort of complete destructive force where we're either going to at a bare minimum destroy ourselves or at a maximum destroy the whole kit and caboodle. And that sort of takeaway message is that it's only at the precipice that we change. It is only at the very last moment when the pressure is at the highest point that we make the change for the better. And that, that, that's, I mean, that follows that Lamarckian evolution, the evolutionary graph, if you were to, to be able to visualize it is not a slow, easy slope that it's periods of stagnation, long periods of stagnation of flat, nothing, nothing happening. And then severe environmental pressure, severe pressure makes the biological evolution happen. Mm -hmm. And that's when it happens. And so that, so when I think about that, that's where I'm kind of like, okay, maybe that's, I hope that that's where we're at is that like, we just require a lot of pressure to make those changes 
and to be able to adapt and survive and, and try to reach homeostasis and try to reach, reach, reach a position to where we can continue to thrive with each other. And I hope, I hope that, but you know, it's, it gets harder and harder. We're getting some of that pressure right now. So maybe all of this will boil over into something positive. Uh, that's a, that's our hope. And, and if, and if it doesn't, and that cynicism and that skepticism in the faith of humanity to be able to reach that point, that if that's the case, then at least through stoicism and, and, and like we we're saying, keep having a positive mental attitude and finding the things to focus on and enjoy in life, that at least we can enjoy the watching it all go down. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm having a great time. Aren't you? <laughs> I am. I am still having a good time. It, it's entertaining. And uh, yeah, we, we talk about these things fairly frequently. And it, it's always good to talk with you because you know about some things that I don't. I know about some things that you don't. And we can bounce oh, yeah. ideas off each other and try to both get a little bit wiser and maybe laugh in the middle of doing it. Oh, yeah, man. There's there's very few humans I enjoy talking to as much as, as you It's always entertaining. It's always enlightening. It's always fun. Good time. Well, I'm really glad that you could come on here. Yeah. Uh, I think that we're going to have to do another episode sometime because there's some other shit that we didn't talk about that I would love to dive into, but I've got other shit I got to do today. So, Sure. Yeah. We're going to have to wrap this, but maybe next month or something, we could do another one. Yeah. 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 We could do a part two. I mean, we've been talking about doing this for five years yeah six five or six years i mean i remember buying a an apogee one because it, and, and the little apogee mic because it would be easy and we could just do it right off our phones and we were like yo let's fuck, fuck let's start a podcast let's finally do this and then like you know how shit happens and then finally you you make it happen and then we're like hey man I, 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 I like listening to your to your casts and uh, i think it's fun and and then finally we pulled it off but i knew even in two hours that we wouldn't get to half of the shit. Nah, dude, there's so many conversations that we've had over the years that have developed into us having the friendship that we have. And uh, yeah, it's been hours and hours and hours and hours of interesting conversations. That's how we, days, you know, got off uh, on that right foot, getting to know each other is because we were talking about really interesting shit. Yeah, And uh, it's not often that I can talk to somebody who knows a bunch of the same things that I do, who's already kind of there. It's it's really a pleasure to not have to start at square one with right. certain topics. You know, you already are aware, aware of a lot of the things that I know. So that yeah. makes it way yeah. easy, way easier. Yeah. Not, not that yeah, I'm uh, awesome. against explaining things to people. If they're curious and want to know, I'm more than happy to try to share yeah, no, yeah, information. Yeah, that's fun too. And- yeah, and it's like it's like you know the more you repeat stuff, the more that you can see how well you understand it. Um, but yeah, but it is just cool to like. There's nothing I could really, no topic I could bring up that you wouldn't know about already. You know, we just know a little different. You know, we we do our own separate little research paths or whatever, and then like, oh, hey, did you hear? Did you hear about this part of that? And you're like, no, oh, oh shit, cool. You know, that's right. But you should. But what start altered carbon? Altered carbon, yeah. Yeah, Netflix Altered Carbon season I'll make one. Make sure I write that down actually right now. Yeah, it's the exact scenario that we were talking about for that for that whole side of things. But but right on. Uh yeah, man. This is badass. Thanks for having me, dude. I appreciate it. I love you. Yeah, thanks for doing it, dude. Lots of love yeah. from here too. I would love to do another chat one of these days. Yeah. We could do another Just podcast. Holler. Yeah, I would love that because there's a handful of topics off the top of my head I can list off that i would love to discuss next time so let's save them for then because okay. there's plenty more interesting topics that we need to <laughs> discuss hell yeah all right man sounds good brother all right dude well where can uh, people find you if they want to look you up yeah uh, it's at nick shins n-i-c-k-s-h-i-n-z that's pretty much i've pretty much changed everything to that so instagram twitter which i don't really use because i hate that platform i think it's just disgusting and then uh uh, <laughs> that was nice. Uh, Facebook is Nick Shangelis, I think. Don't really use that one anymore. I'm primarily on Instagram. So everybody hit him up on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then uh, YouTube is Nick Shins as well, too. But uh, yeah, but uh, that's all my stuff. And um, uh, human beings, man. Come on. 
Let's do this. Last question before we get this thing wrapped. You can pass one message along to future generations. What would you want to tell them? Shit. You know, I, I gave you this joke answer yesterday for it with the intention of like coming up with like contemplating it, you know, like what, what my real answer would be. And then I guess I never really, it never really formulated it because it's such a massive question, but I guess it's, if I were to say one thing that you can pass on, it's uh, to make yourself a better person than you were the previous day. Beautiful. If, if everybody does that, everything else should fall into place. Hell yeah. It's concise and very wise. I like it. All right. I'll take it. Right on, everybody. Enjoy your days. Enjoy your lives. Yes. Aliens. Aliens, come get me, please. Help. Come help Nick. All right, dude. (laughs) That's a wrap. And this concludes part two of the interview with Nicholas Shangelis. Thanks a lot for listening, everybody. Feel free to shoot me an email at podcast at riffsordie.com. Go to patreon.com slash riffs or die if you want to sign up as a patron and get access to discounts at the web store and live Zoom hangouts. And don't forget to go to riffs or die.com to pick up some merch. Lots to talk about on the next episode. Until then, take care of yourselves, everybody. Much love from me to you. Bye bye, everyone. <laughs>